absolutely out of control. The boat was just out of control. The speedo just screaming. The boat totally underwater. At the time, you just want to get off the bus. With the wind blowing 30, with the snow coming down on the deck, with everybody freezing cold, with the boat all rocked up out of control, it was a pretty hairy moment. And I was really scared for the guy's life. It can be scary. It can scare the living daylights out of me. But maybe that's why we do it. This is the story of the 97-98 Whitbread Round the World race for the Volvo Trophy. Ten boats, nine legs, around 150 sailors. The seventh Whitbread started in Southampton back in September 1997 and ended back there in May 1998, nearly nine months and 32,000 miles later. But the Whitbread is not just racing around the world. It's Grand Prix racing around the world in volatile, comfort-free, thoroughbred Whitbread 60s. It's a gripping story, and one that began off cows on a perfect sailing day on September the 21st, 1997. The start of the 97-98 Whitbread Round the World Yacht Race for the Volvo Trophy. So here's got a good start to Sheba starting right down. Right out in front of the Royal Yacht Squadron has got a magnificent start. Dixon's got it right on the button. Problem on there with Norris Smith. Spinnaker going up late. They won't be happy about that. They're losing vital ground. They're losing. They're back in the pack. A lot of activity. Great pictures from the on board. So that is ear of language out to the left. That is Paul Kayard. To the right, the white spinnaker. That is Swedish match. What a beautiful start for Gunnar Kranz with Roger Nilsson and Earl Williams. Paul Kayard stretching out. Leading the 10 boat lineup out of Southampton at the start of the nine month journey was EF Language, a Swedish entry skippered by America's cup sailor Paul Kayard, his first time on the Whitbread. Silk cut with British skipper and three-time Whitbread veteran Laurie Smith headed out to the Solent, one of the favourites of the race. They're working with that wheel, throwing it about, moving the boat from left to right, finding the best track. Merritt Cup were also looking like a strong entry with a powerful New Zealand crew, skippered by another well-known Whitbread veteran, Grant Dalton. It's still neck and neck between these two. This really is Grand Prix sailboat racing. One of the interesting things is also that Five yachts are going with 11 crew. And but overall race favourite was American boat Toshiba, a syndicate managed by the world's most renowned sailor, Dennis Connor, and skippered by Chris Dixon. But all of these boats are in this race. The first 7,350 mile leg to Cape Town got off to a furious start, with constant lead changes as the boats entered the English Channel. But progress ground to a dramatic halt as boats wallowed in fog and light airs off the coast of France. Two days in and the wind returned. The race was back on. Toshiba, choosing an inshore course off the coast of Portugal, dropped back into sixth, a drastic 93 miles behind the leaders. And despite moments of optimism on board, Toshiba was losing ground by the day. They're uh, finally taking some distance off the front, guys. Not a lot, but just two or three miles of skin. Nice to know the hard work pays off. And there's just about enough skids left that at that rate, up at the front, Norwegian boat Innovation Caverna led into the second week. Knut Frostad, the youngest skipper of the fleet, and navigator Marcel van Triest headed an ebullient crew. Seem to slowly be pulling away from the rest of the fleet, which is very encouraging. The fact that we've just discovered that we've left all our soap, shampoo and razors and shaving foam behind don't seem to worry us so much that we're, because we're doing well. 500 miles adrift at the back of the fleet, Dutch boat Brunel Sunnage's abysmal progress was made all the more painful following a collision with a whale. Before we saw uh, some uh, some baby whales and some very big whales uh, well well ahead of us, and then uh, just afterwards we heard a very loud bang, and then we felt she was on the rudder. And then uh, we realised that almost half of the rudder was gone. The resulting damage forced Brunel to head for the coast of Brazil to effect repairs, pushing them back even further. 
On board America's Challenge, 200 miles off the pace, the Whitbread first-timers were treated to an initiation ceremony as the boat crossed the equator. Ahead of them and hot on the tail of race leaders Caverna, Dutch sailor Dirk de Ridder was given similar treatment aboard Merritt. 5,000 miles into the race and the top three boats were as tight as ever. The next strategic question, how to round Trindade, the final waypoint of the leg. EF opted to take a westerly course, with Merritt and Caverna on their inside. It was a good call. While they picked up more breeze, Caverna started to slow. Behind, the fleet was beginning to spread out. Trindade was now in sight. Young Knut Frostad could only watch his two-week lead diminish. Behind on Merritt Cup, there was intense discussion on how best to sail around Caverna and into the lead. But EF language was steaming up. Kayard's constant attention to detail already showing positive results. It pays to uh, work extra hard here. Every inch is gold. And that's exactly what we're doing here on the EF language, grinding down Merritt Cup and Caverner uh, about a half a mile an hour. I remember a couple of epic watches and just like 20 sail changes in four hours. Like unbelievable, just non-stop changing sails, fighting tooth and nail, thinking, man, when the next sked comes out, we're going to be 30 miles behind. You know, we've, done, we've been parked on nothing. It's a nightmare. We've been headed the wrong way and, and, um, and came out 10 miles ahead. You know, and that was like brought tears to the boys' eyes. You know, that was big. Chasing EF's newfound lead, Grant Dalton felt it wasn't just slick sailing. What he had was a code zero, and we didn't at the start. That's what made the sail program better. And, and uh, I will never change my opinion of code zeros till the day I die. I think they were illegal. They were um, uh, totally in contrary to the spirit of the rule. And, and I think there were some very weak decisions made in allowing them through. We've got EF language about a mile in front of us. And just behind us is uh, Innovation Krona. There's a real dull patch just before the island, which will bring everybody in concert, 10 of them. And now we're getting the breeze out the other side. So it's two and a half thousand miles to go. About three and a half miles separate the first three boats. And now it's all on. EF's decision to turn south after Trindade was paying off, becoming a critical maneuver as they continued to pull miles out from Merritt and Caverna. Behind, the women's team aboard sister ship EF Education, skippered by Christine Guillou, were not so fortunate as they floundered in ninth place, 500 miles behind. At the moment, I think we're um, ninth out of ten boats, and um, it's been a pretty tough three weeks for us, I think. It was all very frustrating and not very easy for the crew because, um, well, we've worked very hard for a year and a half and, and you don't feel like you want to start the whip bread at the back of the fleet. Ahead in sixth, things were going from bad to worse on America's challenge. Campbell Fields had lost the top of his finger during a jive. Behind them, Swedish match in eighth was now the back marker of a trio of boats languishing in the light airs. We played the inch by inch game with America's challenge and Toshiba, and now they are just under the horizon. Not under, we can see them. They are on the horizon. Very, very close. And uh, somebody switched the power off. You see it's all black around here. No wind whatsoever. The light airs meant food rationing. Much of it, but it tastes good. But no such problems for Kayard at the front of the fleet. Let me get a quick, quick look in there and see what you got. Can you see that? How? Look at the tone. Can you see the tone? Wow. Isn't that, that beautiful? Looks delicious. Notice the contrasting colors. You have brown and beige. <laughs> Earth mixed with a little bit of tan. Earth tones. It's important to have colors because it warms the palate. Yeah. Entices the palate. Well, look Notice forward the to foam it. here. You see, it's just like an espresso. The skume. That's also a very important characteristic of a well-prepared meal. The Whitbread is quite a strenuous competition physically, whether it's sleep deprivation or not eating really enough food. Um, it's not so much we don't eat enough food, it's that we burn a, a lot of calories. We're burning four to 5,000 calories a day. Um, part of that is being awake a lot more than usual. When you don't sleep, um, your metabolism is working at a much higher rate, and so you're burning more calories. This is the water that we use on Chessie. It's originally seawater that we bring in through the bottom of the boat. 
It's then ran through a water maker or desalinator and the water tastes just fine. The only problem with it is it doesn't have some of the minerals that we need. If you are losing magnesium, if you're eating too less with a lot of this uh, energy and whatever, you, you can't concentrate. You, ca you, will, you can't make the right decision out there and you, you will be fatigued. With Merrick Cup nearly a day away, Paul Kayard and his crew steamed into Cape Town to cross the line 29 days after they left Southampton to record an emphatic leg one victory. Underdog at the outset, this was early confirmation of Kayard's confidence. If you believe in yourself and you think you're going to get there, it is not a disadvantage. In fact, it is an advantage to have the other people think you're weak. And so whenever I find myself in that situation, I don't try to talk back to the critics. If the critics want to paint me as a 20 to 1 underdog, that's fine, because anybody who believes that is more susceptible to take a hard fall. A second for merit was hard-earned for Grant Dalton, with the Caverna youngsters relegated to third. <laughs> Further back, the boys on America's Challenge lost an average 10 kilos each, but would have only a moment's respite from the gloom of hunger. It has been announced by Neil Barth, syndicate chairman, that America's Challenge must reluctantly withdraw from the Whitbread race due to unforeseen circumstances involving a third party in Mexico. I am a professional yachtsman. I entered this race with the view of winning the race, not to compete just to sail around the track. If we do not have the budget to compete with the other boat, I am not continuing with the race. Bad news also for Toshiba, as three days after finishing in sixth, Chris Dixon resigned. The problems that were uh, apparent before the start of the race were very much more apparent during the race in the boat preparation, in electronic equipment that wasn't working because it never been tried, in sails that, were, uh, that uh, were falling apart. I haven't been hired to ride around in, in the middle of the course. There's no, really no point sailing along where we've been. Dixon's replacement was Whitbread veteran and Toshiba watch captain Paul Stanbridge. And as they left Cape Town, Stanbridge was blissfully unaware of the troubles which would lie ahead. With 4,600 miles in front of them, this was the first journey into the Southern Ocean. On board Swedish match, skipper Gunnar Krantz and navigator Roger Nielsen had a point to prove. The biggest budget of the race and only an eighth place to show for it. First off the line and leading the charge out of Cape Town, Silk Cut's lead wilted in the dying wind. And a gutsy move from Swedish match saw them sail around the whole fleet and away into the lead. We are actually in, in the lead at the moment. And the reason for that is that we acted totally against what we said what we should do. Stick with the fleet is what we said, and here we are. We took off on a little flyer on our own, the only boat that took off offshore, away from land. And that was the big, uh, big advantage for us. By that evening, Krantz and his crew had a 35-mile lead. First into the big winds of the Southern Ocean, it was a margin that would carry them to Freeman. Swedish Match's campaign had been the brainchild of navigator Roger Nilsson, a past skipper of the Whitbread, who brought on Krantz and New Zealand tactician Earl Williams as co-skipper. Well, us three as a, as a sort of decision-making group on the boat, we are all very different people and that contributes more than take away from a group. I think that we have to be very, very different. And it's hard to be only one person to make all the decisions. It's always good to toss it around a little bit. We've been able to do that in a very successful format. Uh, and Earl is a, you know, he's a very good tactician, strong, can push the boat. I can go to sleep and I know that the boat is being driven as hard as ever. Uh, and that's, that's a good feeling. EF language's inexperience in Southern Ocean conditions was painfully apparent as the boat reported a never-ending list of damage and breakages on board. Kayard was pushing too hard. I really think that I'm 90% uh, to blame for our difficulties in the Southern Ocean. I mean, the guys, they do, they do the same good job all the time. What the problem was is that my whole life in sailing has been about seconds and inches, and I was in a situation where really miles and minutes or hours are the measure. Kayard's fourth position was being threatened by the Silk Cut Boys, who stormed past an injured EF language, breaking the world monohull record in the process. 
boat had covered an incredible 449 miles in a 24-hour run. Behind them, Chesney Racing and Merritt, worst hit by light airs earlier in the leg, were 900 miles off the pace. All the boats were witnessing a brutal onslaught of Southern Ocean conditions. Toshiba in third place was no exception. And the boat just leapt off this wave and we speared into this trough and the dial was well over 30 in, in boat speed and we just fell into the pit, the bow buried and the whole boat was totally submerged and we were head down just hanging on and the boat pulled up so quickly it, it basically cartwheeled. The, um, the whole boat spun on its axis and um, I was clipped on with my harness onto a, onto a pad eye that was right next to me, was thrown in the air until my harness took up and just spun the whole arc of my harness and just head first into the deck and it blew one of my boots off. So here I was in the middle of the boat, the whole rig and the whole boat shaking because we've got two sails that are flapping out the side of the boat and the boat's on its side and the wave breaks over and guys are literally hanging there and you know, minus two degrees water temperature in the depths of the Southern Ocean, and we are all like, geez, is this really happening? Having led for the entire leg, Swedish match arrived to a spectacular welcome in Fremantle. Krantz back on four. The key components was to keep the boat uh, together, yeah. not break anything serious, uh, keep pushing hard, uh, you know, accelerate and break at the same time. Uh, the team spirit above everything. Everybody's been fighting so hard all the way. Next into Fremantle, Innovation Caverna, now overall race leaders with two top three finishes. It was more win than I've uh, ever been in on this leg. I mean, it was very hard. It was, it was it never let go. It was just non-stop every day for days and days and days. It was non-stop. Damage the ball, so we had to slow down for 24 hours. And just when we finished the repair work, we no sleeping for a day. Uh, this huge wave breaks over the boat and wipes out the steering wheel. And you uh, can't believe it. We managed to get it all back. That second for Gaberna put the young dark horse Knut Frostad in the overall lead, while the win for Swedish match restored morale after a first leg disaster. Merit, seventh, a nightmare for Whitbread veteran Grant Dalton. The second leg was an absolute disaster for us. Probably living in the belief that our first leg had been really good and we had the answers. And really, at the end of that leg, we had to address the whole thing pretty hard. I came off the deck as such as a watch captain and went into a sort of support role and a discussion role, if you like, with the navigator. There were discussions on Brunel Sonnergy too, and with two last places behind them, out went Hans Buscholt, and in came Olympic bronze medalist Roy Heiner. Basically, we, I mean, I have to learn the boats, new guys on the boats, we have to do a lot of learning. So the learning curve will be very high, and uh, I'm very hopeful that we can uplift the campaign to, to end up uh, halfway in the fleet, at least. After three weeks of rest and running repairs to the boats, the fleet was once again on its way. The next leg, a 2,250-mile journey to Sydney, was being treated as a sprint leg, even though it would take an estimated 10 days at sea. left Fremantle, there was trouble in store for race leaders Caverna. Dents and small buckles were discovered on the lower part of their mast, forcing them to make for the coast. Right now I'm just cutting up an anchor to try and reinforce the mast. And I don't know why I always end up with these jobs. There's 11 other guys and they should be pretty handy with tools, should they? But Willett's efforts were in vain and further equipment was needed. In accordance with race rules, they anchored within one mile of the shore and were then able to receive assistance by way of a helicopter drop. A week later, as the boats headed towards King Island at the entrance of Bass Strait, EF Language headed the fleet. Once into the Bass Strait, the fleet compressed as changing winds levelled the playing fields. Sailing in the Bass Strait, about 400 miles from Sydney, and we've crossed jives, I think, with almost every boat in the fleet, except the girls and Swedish match. Uh, place changes is just... This is our schedule for last, we were second, now we're fifth, next schedule could be first. Wind is shifting all over the place, it's, uh, 
bit of a typical day in the Bass Strait. There was drama on board the Norwegian boat when Knut Frostad's bowman and sailmaker, Albi Pratt, was washed off deck in heavy seas. It's been quite a hard night, actually. We started with losing a guy overboard and managed to pick him up. And after that, we had severe seas, very big waves, and we had to slow down the boat because we have a rig that is not 100%. With 70 miles of sailing to go and about six hours to the finish, the fleet was flying. EF Language were gunning for number one. They'd just taken Swedish match, who were equally determined to record a second leg victory. Throughout the fleet, the boats were in sight of one another. Chessy Racing doing everything possible to pull away from Merritt Cup and Caverna. On board Merritt, the tension mounted. Dalton needed to win the battle. Behind him, Silk Cut and Toshiba were fighting it out for sixth. After nine and a half days of sailing, it was Paul Kayard who arrived in Sydney in the early hours of the morning to cross the finish line only five minutes ahead of Swedish match. For Gunnar Kranz and his crew, it looked like it could be another top three podium position. But with Chessie only boat lengths behind, just which position was less certain. In the end, Chessie missed the second spot by only 52 seconds. And with the prospect of Christmas in Sydney, EF Language and her triumphant crew were welcomed into Darling Harbour. I've been in a lot of tight races before, and to finish uh, after 2,400 miles, everybody within, I don't know, 20 miles, it's just an incredible race, and the guys did what we had to do to pull it off. By then, we had won two of the first three legs, and we had seen the Southern Ocean, and sure, we didn't handle it well, but we had seen it, we had analyzed it, I felt like we had dealt with it, I was waiting for the opportunity of leg five. Um, and meanwhile, points-wise, we were on the top. Um, I knew I had a fast boat, I knew the crew was compatible and working out well, so I could see that I had the tools to win, and it was just a matter of executing it. Back in third, there was a big moment for 57-year-old owner-skipper George Collins. Yeah, it was just unreal. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of pounding and a lot of hard sailing, a lot of boredom. And to have the nine boats together, plus the coastline, I mean, it was just, uh, it was spectacular. The only private owner in the race, Collins brought on skipper John Kostecki to replace Mark Fisher out of Fremantle. This, it seems, was the move that would change Chessie's fortunes. Injury on the whip red is commonplace, and Chessie had her fair share on leg three. And we were just pounding into these waves, and it was a situation where if you're sailing upwind, it's, that's the hardest condition to go up the mast. After he stropped the spinnaker off, we were easing him down, and he got to the third spreaders, and we just smashed into a massive wave. I couldn't hold on, I got spun off the rig, and went for a bit of a flyer around the rigging, and ended up Ended up way, way back there, hanging on to the, to the running back stays. You're a doctor. You've trained your whole life with this stuff. When you're a Whitbread medic, you've trained for six months, and they've given you books this thick and all sorts of instructions. But the bottom line is, you know, you've got a friend who's really hurt. It's a sick feeling in your stomach because there isn't a thing you can do. With less than 14 days in port, the fleet set off once again, this time for the 1,270-mile dash from Sydney across the Tasman Sea, around north of New Zealand, and down to Auckland. Short, but intense. The hardest on the body and the brain are the shortest legs, because you never get into the rhythm. And you sort of have the crew sitting for two, three days on the rail. They live on the rail. They eat on the rail. They sleep on the rail. They do everything on the rail. So from a mental stress point of view, the short legs are, are uh, uh, very, very tough, and also from a uh, you know, physical point of view, you never sleep properly, and you don't eat enough. And it's very tough for the body. Once again, it had been Paul Kayard who led the fleet away from the coast and into the Tasman. Behind him, Silk Cut briefly took over the lead as the gap widened between them and the back markers. As the pack began to split, positions changed constantly. By the middle of the leg, Swedish match nosed ahead of Toshiba to take up the lead on its way to Cape Rienga on the northern tip of New Zealand. On board the match, co-skipper Earl Williams was eager to be the first New Zealander home, and for a while it looked as though he would. 
But just around the top of New Zealand at Cape Rienga, Swedish match sailed into a hole, stopping dead, helplessly looking on as four boats sail past. Well, around the top of New Zealand now, and boy, it's been dramatic. Uh, we're now have gone from third place to first place, uh, and Swedish match that was leading has gone back to uh, fifth place. We've got Chessy racing about 500 metres just here. We've got Toshiba about um, three quarters of a mile just up there, then EF, and you can just see Swedish match on the horizon. There was a big hole under Cape Reang at the top of New Zealand, and we have, with Chessy, come inside it saw the, what had happened to, unfortunately, the Swedish match and come inside it now. It's a real drag race. With only three miles dividing first from fourth, there was everything to play for. But the main battle would be between Merritt and Toshiba, who match raced the entire way to Auckland. When we were in front, it was, you, know, you would have had to torpedo us to get us out of first place because you know, in front of a home crowd, there was no way they were going to get through. Merritt took the gun. Toshiba crossed the line two and a half minutes later. <laughs> With Dalton and ten Kiwis as crew, Merritt Cup to the Auckland crowd might as well have been a New Zealand boat. And for Dalton himself, it would be a very special victory. For Laurie Smith and Silk Cut, leg four was a case of the same old story. Up with the leaders at the start, they came unstuck due to what appeared to be poor navigational decisions. In Auckland, it was announced that their navigator, Steve Hales, was resigning, and Vincent Geek was being talked through the boat's equipment. It was much his decision to step down as it was mine to uh, say, you know, let's make a change. And uh, maybe uh, Vincent being a bit older and he has worked with me longer in the past, um, will say, shut your face, this is what we're doing, you know. There was less than two weeks to get the boats back in order for leg five and the Southern Ocean, and the crews needed all that time to get back into peak fitness, the demands of the Whitbread being brutally debilitating. Their motivation often goes down. Um, they find it harder to keep focus. The concentration is poorer. In fact, all their mental faculties become poorer. Decision-making, reaction time, all of course of which are extremely important when you're on a boat. In, in most jobs, the hours that the guys on the boats are working, it wouldn't be allowed. It would not be acceptable. The battle against sleep deprivation is a constant feature of the Whitbread. Although comparatively short, leg four proved particularly challenging for the crews. Considering it's such a short leg, it was actually very demanding. It was only five days, um, but we have quite an intense watch system on Toshiba. We do four hours on watch, four hours on standby, and four hours off. However, in a short leg, the four hours on standby become almost four hours on. If ever the boat changes direction in a tack or a jive, then the whole crew are woken up, they have to change sides. And not only do they change sides, they take all the bedding with them, and they take any sails that are down below, all the safety gear and all the food. Um, which amounts to about a tonne. Um, having stacked all that, you go back to bed, and then maybe 20 minutes later, you might tack back again. Leg five took the fleet into the Southern Ocean once more. Heading further south and on leg two, there's the added possibility of hitting icebergs. This and Cape Horn, the ultimate challenge, requires a particular kind of mental preparation. Before you can make that commitment and go there is, is uh, really painful. You distance yourself from your family and the people you love, and it's hard to talk about before you go. Uh, I definitely just kind of faded off into space from, you know, the people who are close to me to kind of mentally get ready for that. On board EF language in the Southern Ocean, Curtis and his fellow crew were once again up with the leaders, sailing aggressively against Swedish match in terrifying conditions. I had one interview over the SATCOM B telephone we have on the boats, and it was a Swedish journalist. He asked me, are you and EF trying to kill each other? What are you doing out there? Because we were just full on in that heavy, heavy, heavy air. And we didn't have any instruments crashing down the waves to keep pushing that night, that very night we were called Midnight Madness. That was, uh, it took a lot of energy out of me and I was scared, especially when the EF reported a small iceberg. And out of the corner of my eye, there was this iceberg come floating along. We were like, 
holy smokes, here we go. And you're like, oh, gee, your heart's going, Jesus. Because then you start thinking, then once you see it, and you know there's an iceberg there, and you know there's little pieces, and then the silk cut guy said they hit it, and you're like, oh, no. Curtis goes, hey, we got to get out of here. The longer time we spend down here, the more chance we have of hitting something. So let's just beeline it out of here, and off we went again. Silk Cut's collision with a small iceberg was upstage when they lost half their mast due to problems with the rigging. Well, as you can see, the excitement and tension is building here on Silk Cut. <coughs> Although the crew were unhurt, the Southern Ocean had taken another casualty. On deck, a jury rig had been cut to fit the mast stump. The crew were struggling to coerce both themselves and the boat onward. Arriving in Ushuaia, Argentina, the demotivated crew knew the disaster had ended any chance of overall victory. On board EF Education, a similar story had begun to unfold. Another broken mast, which would result in the girls being at sea for five weeks, a record for any Whitbread crew. By the 13th day, the fleet was powering its way towards Cape Horn, with EF language having opened up a 100-mile lead over a tightly bunched Swedish match to Sheba, Merit Cup and Caverna. Well, I think Cape Horn is, um, obviously means closure to what really is the lap around the planet. It all happens in the Southern Ocean, it all happens in the Southern Hemisphere, Basically, it all happens from Cape of Good Hope to Cape Horn. Behind KR, despite being slowed in dying winds, the chasing group celebrated their tour around the Horn. But once around the Horn, the winds died altogether and the chasing pack were parked up as they struggled in the ridge of high pressure off the Falkland Islands. By the time the wind filled in again, Chesie and Brunel had caught up and overtaken, whilst Innovation Caverna, trying to escape, had run up against a three-knot current. Our biggest mistake came during Lake 5 from Auckland to Brazil, I think, when uh, we realised, uh, when we were parked up with most of the fleet of the Falkland Islands, we took more risk than was wise and, uh, and tried to sort of uh, get desperately at least a second place out of that leg. Well, that backfired badly and we got a seventh place out of that leg. And, um, well, for then, at that moment, the, the overall result for us was sort of over. But up at the front, Paul Kayard and EF Language were very much in touch with overall glory. They approached Sao Sebastião in time for Carnival, recording their third leg victory. Sunergy's brave move to the east of the Falklands was rewarded as they held off Chessy Racing for second. A momentous moment for Roy Heiner and his crew making their first podium appearance. A third win for EF Language was just what the opposition dreaded. Paul Kayard pulling away once more. Silk Cut's disaster put Smith way off the pace and for Toshiba in sixth, worse was just about to come. Paul Stanbridge was called before an international jury as Toshiba stood accused over an incident where the crew had started the engine to clear weed from the propeller. Toshiba has been disqualified from leg five um, of this Whitbread Round the World race. Um, I'm obviously very disappointed with the jury's decision, but that is their decision and that's final. I think it's very harsh, but there we go. The start from Sao Sebastião was the most chaotic of the race, with everyone turning out to see the boats off on their 4,750-mile charge up the American coastline to Fort Lauderdale. Leading the boats out of the bay was Innovation Caverna. On board, new crew member, tactician Ed Baird, already making his presence felt. Leaving Brazil, the boat stayed in close proximity, the lead ricocheting between Chessy Racing to Sheba and Innovation Caverna. And back at sea, just two days after their Leg 5 marathon, EAF Education were in high spirits. Here we are on EAF Education. You're 
very happy at the moment because we're surrounded by blood. They're everywhere. Down there, over there, up there, over there. Everywhere. There's boys all over the ocean. Crossing the doldrums, the fleet went to school territory. And whilst providing momentary relief from the stifling heat, the thunderstorms were a feature to be avoided. South Trist, navigator on board Innovation Kreiner, Saturday the 21st of uh, March. Very much in per downs, one scare that we gain, one scare that we lose. The reasons for these uh, losses and gains at this stage are uh, these little puppies, we are all clear up here right now. The rain squalls, they're very frequent here in the doldrums. Right now, right now we're quite fortunate because there's only one on the screen. Uh, one of these can make uh, you lose a gain 10 miles within an hour, just like that. Coming in fast from the east, Swedish match had missed most of the storms, moving up from last to third behind a dueling EF language and silk cut. Silk cut crossing to the outside gained on language, who'd been caught out by a wind shift and forced to change course. Uh, we just got back in the lead with three miles ahead of here. We've got to keep the speed on, but at the same time we're trying not to break stuff. It's pretty hard to do when you get some of these and leave ticks on now. With EF language closing on the British boat, Laurie Smith finally steered across the finish line in Fort Lauderdale first. Having left Southampton as one of the favourites, Silk Cut's repeated failure to live up to expectations had resulted in a number of criticisms from the press, making victory on this lake all the more significant. Basically, we've had 12 guys who've battled for 18 months to get to where we are now, and we've had a lot of setbacks. We've been knocked back, we've had things go wrong on us, we broke a rig in the last leg, and for us, it's a sort of personal satisfaction that we are actually good enough. We've always known that, but sometimes you have to tell the rest of the world, and the only way you can do that is to go out and beat them. Just over an hour later came the overall race leader, EF Language. K.R. not happy with second. You know, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated, a little upset, because we had a chance to win that race and we didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't pull the trigger. Uh, obviously, Rudy and I got to do a better job of figuring out the weather so that we don't get ourselves on the wrong side of the, of the track. I just, for me personally, I get a really bad taste in my mouth when I'm in the lead in something and start backing down. I just can't take it, you know? I could take being smart, and I will say one thing, last night I was stupid. When we couldn't lay a Luthra there, or when we were really pressed up with the A6, we should have changed chutes. We were risking the rig, and we were risking the spinnaker. Don't look too down, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I realize the big picture, but I see some small things that we could do, we could do better, and it frustrates me when we don't. So I just want us to keep, I want us to kick ass. <laughs> Disappointment for the American was tempered by the knowledge that victory over the only other serious contenders to the race title, Swedish Match and Merit Cup, meant an increase in his overall points total. Swedish Match's third place into Fort Lauderdale displaced Merit Cup in second overall vindicating the tactics of the crew's breakaway move east on the leg. After three weeks in dock, the fleet was back to the business of catching runaway leaders EF language. The short leg to Baltimore saw an interesting manoeuvre by Brunel Sanergy. There were two options. One was to follow the Gulf Stream and use that, and the other was to go with the forecast, which was uh, for more pressure on the right to start with, and then uh, eventually wind going to the northeast, which was going to mean if you, if you had leverage to the right, you can make very big gains. Heiner's lead lengthened as the boats behind headed into an unwanted coal front. A little race on our hands here, Jogi. Swedish match. EF language was once again locked in battle with the one boat who posed any threat to an overall victory. After 750 miles and three days of sailing, the boats were on the approach to Chesapeake Bay. Brunel, 30 miles ahead, continued to be pursued by the dueling couple. With both crews fighting for every tenth of a knot of boat speed, they'd begun to make gains on Brunel. The Dutch had run into light airs, and the progress after the Chesapeake Bay Bridge was dramatically slow. 
It was only as they sailed their final few yards that the most surprising victory of the race looked certain. These moments are nice. I mean, these moments does a lot for Dutch sailing, and that's uh, fantastic for the next win. Wonderful. Behind, the battle still raged for second place, only a few boat lengths separating the two. On board Swedish Match, the crew focused on the best time to jibe for the finish. One bad bit of boat handling, one wrong decision, and Swedish Match would lose their slim advantage. Three days of combat saw Swedish Match heading for second, yet Skipper Krantz only acknowledged they'd done it two seconds before the gun. Yeah! Behind the Swedes, another duel had commenced between 7th place Chessy Racing and Toshiba. Match Racing America's Cup style, the two boats continually swapped places, racing neck and neck until Toshiba slipped away. With Dennis Connor at the helm, Toshiba would be the first American boat home in the closest finish in Whitbread history. EF Education crossed the finish line only nine minutes later. But when the party was over, Christine Guillou would take Connor to protest for violating the rules by crossing directly in front of them during the night and causing them to take evasive action. Connor lost, and there were more shocks in store as navigator Andrew Cape resigned. No comment. Totally surprised. I just spent uh, three days with him and had no inkling of it. It seemed like he was in a good mood and everything was fine, so it certainly uh, caught me off guard. The decision of the jury penalised Toshiba two places on the leg. Things couldn't be worse for the pre-race favourites, now totally out of the running for any overall podium position. With two legs still to sail, only Swedish match could mathematically catch EF language and it would take the sale of Gunnar Krantz's life to pull it off. The points stacked up to a final podium possibility for Silk Cut, but Toshiba were out of it. Next to face the fleet, the 3,390-mile leg from Baltimore Annapolis to La Rochelle, navigating around an exclusion zone established by the race organisers concerned by the southerly extent of drifting icebergs. At this point, Merrick Cup had eked out a slight advantage over second place Toshiba, hot on their tail. As the two boats resumed an all too familiar battle, swapping leads over the following week, Dalton and his crew were revelling in each new sked, detailing merit pulling away from the rest of the fleet. <laughs> 35.9 EF. Sorry? 35.9. 35.9. Uh, I'm going to give you another yes. place of the 60 in the 6th one. Oh, yes! Some way off the pack was Silk Cut and Chessy, seemingly out of the picture. Miles behind and in the north. Not so by the halfway mark, as the two made dramatic progress up the fleet, making the best of big wins and travelling a staggering five to six knots faster than the leaders. As they scream towards the front enders, Silk cut in one 18-hour period, clawed back 80 miles as the speed dial was showing record-breaking runs. Another success story was EF Education, who, with the help of Isabella Tizier, was sailing their best leg of the race. Silk Cut's northerly route saw it storm through to second place. Merrick Cup, alongside EF Language, chose to cover Swedish Match in the south. We're down here watching our buddies on the blue boat, Swedish Match. But the good news is we can smell the croissants with the easterly breeze. So, uh, boys are looking forward to a little cafe au lait and croissants, maybe Sunday morning if we're lucky. For Swedish Match, this leg had been their last chance to topple the race leaders. But languishing in sixth, Skipper Krantz had given up. That's when we lost the chance of winning overall. From then on, we said, OK, we have a good second place. Uh, we lost a bit of points to merit in the eighth leg. That was costly. Uh, but we did say to each other, still a good result coming up here. Let's play it nice and safe and 
and um, just go for the second and be happy with that. Up front, Toshiba continued to set the pace until... Today we've been attacked by a shark. Um, we're a bit disappointed to see Silk cut after having a commanding lead of about uh, 120 miles for most of this leg. Um, suddenly they came back from the dead, which was most disappointing, particularly for me. Um, but, but there we go. Uh, so my old pommy mates over there. stayed in visual contact with Silk Cut all the way to the finish. Um, maximum distance was two miles apart and very often inside of a mile. But we did remain in front of them for the whole time. They got to within about six boat lengths of us just before the finish when we fell into a bit of a hole as the wind was going through a transition. It was a particularly nerve-wracking time for me. It was going to be my one chance um, to win a leg. Um, so it's kind of now or never, and uh, luckily we, we did beat them in the end by a 10 minute margin. Um, so yeah, very rewarding, very satisfying to uh, beat, especially what we consider a good boat, and um, my former skipper, obviously, Laurie Smith. Behind Silk Cut and third place Chassis Racing, the girls on EF Education were celebrating their finest hour. Delighted Christine Guillou and her tactician Isabella Toussier face the press. Good crew, uh, good, uh, good time. You know, it was really very, very nice for us. It was the best leg of the... And we arrived in France. It was the best leg of the regret for us, for the position to arrive in France, for the crew, for everything. It was great. Sailing into La Rochelle in sixth, EF Language played down the fact that they were now guaranteed the Whitbread win. The real celebration would have to wait until Southampton. I think the big key for us was what we learned on leg two, not being afraid to criticize ourselves and look ourselves in the mirror in Fremantle and say, what did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong? Let's sort this out now. Let's document it and then review that in Auckland before leg five and go out in leg five and kick butt. And that was the Whitbread Round the World race for EF Language right there. For Kayard, leg nine might have just been a formality. Nevertheless, he led out of La Rochelle. But for five of the boats, second place was still very much up for grabs as they embarked on the final 450 miles to Southampton. With only two days of sailing ahead of them, it would be a match race all the way. Merit Cup entered the final 100 miles in the lead. But better news for Grant Dalton was that Swedish match was way back in fifth. Suddenly, the fight for second was all on. Racing alongside EF Language at a steady 10 knots, with the end of the race looming, it was time for reflection. Final sunset of the Whitbread round the world race of all time. Ah, oh, we're racing today, but every once in a while, we're, you know, thinking about it. Once we've done this, you know, our 12 guys will we'll have something special that we'll remember for the rest of our lives. It's the one time you'll ever fall in love with a guy without being, you know, from the other side there. Because you live and die off your crew members. You find out that the biggest thing the whip bread is about is, is the six inches between your ears. You know, how, how tough is that? One aspect of the race that I think it draws the whole whip bread fleet together is such a large element of danger. And I think that's probably why we're all very, very close friends, whether we're on AF or whether we're on, you know, Brunel or on Toshiba or Chessie. This was proving to be a fitting finale to the race. The boats tightly bunched throughout the two days, a testament to the competitiveness of the fleet. But in the end, there can be only one winner, and for leg nine, it was to be Merit Cup. With their nearest rival, Swedish Match, still fighting through the wind shifts of the Solent with Silk Cut, Dalton was biting his nails for second place, a result that was bittersweet. I think if there was one fundamental early on era that we made when I understand how it was made is we were probably too dogmatic in our choice of boats. Um, we had the opportunity to have a boat very similar to EF and we didn't take it. But the story of the race was EF language and 49-year-old Magnus Olsen finally winning at his fourth attempt.
this race was it was a tough race. I was coming into an environment that I didn't know too well, the offshore sailing, and I thought we would struggle at first, but that in the end we would grind it out. In a sentence, could you describe what the Whitbread has been for you? It's been the most outstanding single experience of my life. Next, it was the turn of Innovation Caverna, finishing third after a mid-race collapse, but a good enough end to leave them fourth overall. The boat Frostad and his team had ousted for their overall position was Silk Cut, coming in fourth and winning an intense battle with Swedish match. And so to the most disappointed crew of the leg. In second overall since the sixth leg, the blue boat was now relegated to third in the light of Dalton's victory. It seemed uh, like it wasn't our turn this time, and uh, we can only say that, OK, we achieved some of what we had set out to achieve, be on the podium, uh, not on the place we expected, but uh, we have to make sure we're somewhere down the line we agree with that, <laughs> that we come to terms with that we ended up third. Might be a good reason as anything else to come back and try again. The closest finish went to Toshiba, arriving in six ahead of Brunel. The end of a difficult campaign and the last throw of the dice for their skipper. I've always looked at the, at the Whitbread as an adventure, and this race has gone past an adventure now. It's now a, a very professional, almost one design yacht race, which perhaps I'm not good enough to win. Brunel Sunnage's skipper, one place further back, resolved to return next time. I had three goals to starting to sail this Whitbread. The one was to grow a beard, the second was to um, see an iceberg, and the third one was to go with 50 knots around the Cape Horn. And none of the three happened, so I'm going to do it again. Home in eighth, another second-place contender. Chessie Racing really missed the boat and the tide. But for George Collins, the Whitbread had all been worthwhile. It's an incredible feeling and uh, very worthwhile. Everybody should go do it. Also caught in the struggle upriver, EF Education. Last overall, but her crew convinced the tide was turning for women's sailing. We've learned a lot of different ways of sailing these boats, and I think that we sail them you know, as, as women, I think we sell them damn well. But in the end, it was all EF language. A formidable boat and a crew led by a skipper who refuses to learn the meaning of the words second place. Now the limits are set, and the boats are parked at the dock, and it's, it's over, and we're going to have to go find some new projects to get us by until we get to go try and smash some more limits again, you know? Break the glass ceiling. <laughs> That's what it's all about, really. So uh, the, trophies are, the trophies are kind of bittersweet, you know, because, because the journey's over and the adventure's over. And...